Hello and welcome back to the YouTube Iceberg. Between having an hour and a half of video wiped and just the general size of the tier, number three was a bumpy road, but we're finally here in tier four. Man, that feels good to say. Anyways, tier four is known as the enthusiast tier, and the description says that this tier is for people with an interest in the weird and obscure part of YouTube, who sometimes watch horror channels and generally watch creepy and weird videos in their spare time. So tier four is the first tier with a shifting trend towards creepy and disturbing stuff, which is probably what a lot of you were expecting when you first clicked on this video series. After all, what's the whole point of an iceberg if it doesn't get progressively more disturbing as it continues? This tier is actually a fair bit shorter than the third in terms of number of entries, but that being said, I'm still going to be splitting it up into three videos since a lot of these have more to talk about, leading them to take more time to finish. Anyways, without further ado, here is part one of tier four of the YouTube iceberg. Ben Wheel is a British computer animator who joined YouTube in 2009. His channel consists of, in his words, surreal horror animation. His most popular video, and the one this Iceberg Charts mentioned specifically, is one titled Henry Eats, uploaded in 2013. Although, according to the description, this video's creation actually dates all the way back to 2003, and was his first short animation. It's kind of a fever dream. It starts out with this melted skull thing eating the heads off this homunculus looking thing. Then it zooms out to this guy who's just kind of sitting there staring at you. Then this other thing comes by and pours him tea, I think? Then this thing comes out of a hole, and then he's in a house, and this other guy comes in and starts doing his thing. All around, it's just a generally weird and unsettling video, and a lot of his other videos are like this, too. Looking at his Instagram, it seems he's still pretty active on the internet, and... Oh, god fucking damn it. Agamemnon Counterpart is a video uploaded all the way back in 2006 by a man named Michael Robinson. The video starts with a message. In the year 2571, a video cassette tape was found in a pile of rubble on the ruins of a certain blue planet. What you're about to witness will not be the contents of the aforementioned cassette. This is an entirely different recording. It's weird, because I always thought the description kind of contradicts that, but whatever. Moving on, it cuts to this alien children's cartoon looking scene, and the words, let's make a new friend, appear on the top of the screen. Then you just hear... screaming. A very loud recording of a man screaming. Back in 2006, this was probably the most insane, scary shit ever, and I do respect the artistic merits of this video, however, a common sentiment that I see in the comment section that's just kinda funny more than scary? Maybe our senses of humor have just collectively gotten weirder and weirder over the past 16 years, but I thought it was kinda funny. Another realization I came to while watching this video is that... Is... Is this analog horror? Like, does it count? It has that VHS thing at the beginning and stuff. I mean, it kind of checks all the boxes. That's really interesting, because all this time I thought Local 58 was the first one, but Agamemnon Counterpart predates that one by over a decade. Agamemnon's origins might actually be even early in 2006, as the description reads that this video is made by a man named Jason Kovac for Destination Imagination 2001, which was an art contest. So yeah, it was just an art project. As for the meaning of the art project, we don't really know. I mean, we don't really know who... Jason Kovac even is. Looking up his name, we can't really find anything besides... Uh, yeah, I'm sure that's the right guy. Popular videos for what this video is even about range from being an alternate dimension to a recreation of an asteroid hitting Earth. We can't really know for certain, but it's still a pretty interesting video nonetheless. Here's one you, the viewer, can test on your own. Go to the YouTube search bar and type a period. Just a period. The results for typing this lead to a whole bunch of videos titled Full Stop Punctuation, but what exactly does that mean? And why does it show up when trying to search for just a period? Well, for some reason, YouTube search reads that period as full stop punctuation, and people took note of that. They also noticed that no one really included those specific words in their video titles, so they began flooding YouTube with these bizarre videos with the title Full Stop Punctuation. These videos would range from shit posts, creepy monster videos, and on some occasions, illegal stuff, like ISIS beheadings. These rose to popularity in 2020, and since then, two years later, the search results have been cleaned up quite a bit, but you can definitely find some weird videos still by doing this. There are also other search terms that result in similar things, like this, or 
this, or this. The thing these all have in common is that apparently the punctuation characters can bypass YouTube's content moderation algorithms somehow, which allows users to post whatever they want without getting taken off the site. It's a pretty clever loophole for anyone who just really, really wants to post beheadings on YouTube for some reason. In an effort to persuade people into buying the full product, many video games will have these anti-piracy measures. These can range from upping the difficulty to an absurd degree so that the game is no longer playable like an Earthbound, or Gary's Mod which provides an error code that is unique to pirated copies so that when you ask about it on forums, everyone knows that you pirated. Or even Game Dev Tycoon, where progressing far enough into the game on a pirated copy will result in your fictional game dev company to go under due to everyone pirating your game. Got their ass. These are only a few examples, and anti-piracy measures have fascinated the internet for years, especially in recent years. This has led people to make fake anti-piracy stuff for certain games that don't really have it, in an effort to be unnerving or creepy. I can definitely understand the phobia, since imagine you're just trying to play your Nintendo game or something, and you see some weird fourth wall breaking message about how you're a criminal, even though it probably wasn't your fault your game is pirated, but rather your parents. I believe the first one of these was this Mario Party DS one posted by Joey Perloni in October of 2020. I remember seeing this show up on my Twitter timeline when it first released, and I'm gonna be honest guys, I thought it was real. Like, it's oddly well made, and either everyone was also fooled by it, or they were just posting it in hopes that they could fool others. I think that's why it took off, since there's nothing more fun than lying on the internet. Like how this Arthur screenshot isn't even what he actually says in the original episode. Anyways, this Mario Party DS one led to others, like a Mario 64 one by the Super Mario 64 Beta Archive. I mean, this video's butterfly effect is fucking crazy. Or this Donkey Kong Country 3 one, uploaded by the Chronic XD. Man, this one's really well made, they even have the unregistered hypercam watermark for added effect. That's dedicated. wait, this one's actually real. Yeah, see, since anti-piracy features in games are oftentimes pretty obscure, hell, I didn't up with the Gmod one until researching for this video, and since the fake ones usually both gain a lot of traction and present themselves in a way that seem real, the line between the real and fake is oftentimes blurred with these. It's pretty interesting. Although, it gets just a bit annoying when you're, I don't know, a YouTuber trying to present factual information to your audience. And I'm not even just referring to myself, I've seen tons of video essays or top 10 lists or what have you that present fake screens is real. Unfortunately, as with any internet trend that's even vaguely horror related, these have also kind of become a little bit less convincing and unnerving as time goes on. Like at some point you're just making Sonic EXE again, which is not a good thing. Either way, fake anti-piracy screens are an interesting trend and have even formed their own little community, which is pretty nice. NYPD Ghost Car Chase, not to be confused with the screamer also called Ghost Car, is police dashcam footage of a car chase posted by One Love Lesbians in 2006. It's a pretty standard chase up until the very end when the car turns to the left. Police try to follow it, only to be met with a fence in their way. So what happened? Is it a ghost car? No. The whole thing was staged. In actuality, the fence was only connected by the top, kind of like a curtain, so the car could just drive right through. It's hard to tell since the video quality is so terrible, even for 2006 standards, and it's shot at nighttime. Still though, it's a pretty fun video. Alan Tutorial was probably one of the first YouTube rabbit holes I personally ever went down. It was a YouTube series that started in 2011 that was seemingly just a parody of those YouTube tutorial videos that don't actually explain much. He talks in a high-pitched, almost childish manner, and explains how to do certain things like pick a blue chair up off the ground. The chair that fell down, first thing you gotta do is you get down to the level of the chair and you touch it. <laughs> or fill a tiny bin with dirt or crush a Dr. Pepper can with slats of wood. Drop it. Which are definitely all very important skills to know. These videos have a pretty good sense of humor, like how in the blue chair video he's fighting back tears the entire time. However, in this one, locked out of room tutorial in parentheses what to do, the videos begin to follow a continuity. Alan gets locked out of his home, desperately tries to find a way back in, and starts crying. The next few videos find Alan homeless, roaming around in the wilderness, burning things, and just doing anything he can both to survive 
and find things to make a tutorial on. Then it seems he gets himself caught into some kind of mental asylum in a plain white room doing videos on various objects he's given. At one point he gets sick of tutorials and starts doing news videos and then by the end of the series the room he's in is just absolutely filthy, covered in this goop and a bunch of random objects. Some people thought this series was real, but in actuality it was a creative project by comedian and filmmaker Alan Resnick, who was responsible for other projects like Live Forever As You Are Now, and two other popular projects that I won't be talking about yet since they're both on the iceberg. Alan tutorial was really cool for me personally since I was watching it when it came out, and mind you most of these videos came out in like 2011 to 2013 when I was like 11. It was the first ARG, unfiction, I don't know what to call it, but it was the first one of those that I ever really followed, so it's very memorable to me personally. I would say it's worth a watch if you like getting freaked out. 11BX1371, commonly referred to as just the Plague Doctor video, was a video that began circling around the internet in early 2015. It shows this guy in a Plague Doctor costume standing around this seemingly abandoned building while holding up numbers with his hands and this strange electronic sound plays. The video originally appeared on 4chan's X, or Paranormal Board, in May of 2015 as a Dropbox link before being uploaded to YouTube the next day by a user named AETBX. Although, it was apparently sent to Swedish tech blog GadgetZZ.com with the title 11B... yeah, you get it. Its original title was a binary code that translated to Muerte, or death in Spanish, and the description is also a bunch of binary text which translates to Takeda uno año menos, or in English, you only have one year left. Strewn about the video were these codes that people got to work decoding. The audio ran under a spectrogram, produced and ciphered messages and several images of tortured and mutilated women. Although, relax, the images were taken from several old murder films, they weren't actually real. Besides one of them, which is a real image of a victim of the Boston Strangler. One of the enciphered messages states, The eagle infected will spread his disease. We are the antivirus, will protect the world body. Another enciphered message found in the video was coordinates to the White House. And another was a Morse code for red lip like 10th, an anagram for kill the president. So it seems like the message of the video was alluding to some form of bioterrorist threat against the United States, I guess. And before you go down to the comment section, like, dude, he, he caused COVID-19. Please remember that this video was uploaded in 2015 and the description said you have one year left, not five. Anyways, after a bit, the creator of the video came forward under the name Parker Warner Wright. After proving he wasn't lying, Parker Wright uploaded a sequel video with this one titled 11B31369, including more secrets and stuff. Shortly after this video was uploaded, he announced that these videos weren't actually real threats and he was simply a performance artist. Since then, he's actually begun uploading to the channel, with his most recent video being uploaded only three weeks ago as of writing this script. Pilot Redson is an animator and musician who began uploading YouTube content in 2012. His animations are often a bit unnerving and avant-garde, I guess. His videos sometimes parody certain pop culture characters like Garfield or The Grinch or various food mascots. Now, a format like that might make you think of certain other channels, but no, 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 no. Pilot Redson is different. Something about the video's animation, humor, and just general vibes are unmistakably unique and just really fucking good. Some of my personal favorites include Preschool Bully, Felonius Bolus, and of course, Grinch's Ultimatum. Pilot Redstone's success has helped immensely by not only his incredible talent for otherworldly animation that uses animation errors as a stylistic choice, but also how he is unironically a really good musician. Like, his album Achievement is one of the best albums I've ever listened to. I would really recommend checking Pilot Redstone out, he's one of the most talented people on the site. One last thing I'd like to mention about him is that his YouTube career actually started not with the Pilot Redstone channel, but actually with this channel called Pokey Remix Studios, which is his first venture both onto YouTube and computer composing music as a whole. Once the Pilot Redstone channel started getting traction, he gradually moved away from the channel, although he uploaded one final video as recently as two years ago with the remix of Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire's Route 113. In the description, he talks about how early that year, the Poke Remix Studios channel had been hacked, and recently he fought to get it back, since it was definitely a project he felt he had moved on from, 
He also had intense sentimental value attached to it, especially after seeing the hundreds of comments left over the past several years. It's honestly a really nice story. Like, I personally had a lot of old, cringy Minecraft videos from when I was 12 on this channel that I just completely deleted, like no privating, just they're not on YouTube anymore. Lost media for sure, so it's really nice that PRS, which by the way can stand for either of his channels, fought to get his stuff back. If you, the viewer, are thinking about deleting your old videos once you grow too old or something, please for the love of god don't. You'll regret it so much. At least like private or enlist them or something, don't ever delete them. Sorry, I'm getting way too off track and sentimental at this point. Let's talk about softcore Minecraft fart porn. Have you ever, in the year of our lord 2022, gone on YouTube and searched Minecraft animation? Doing so is a bit of a cognito hazard, as it's a window into what maybe your little cousin is watching while they're staring at their iPad. One example is a channel called PanPanXD, whose videos are just meaningless drivel, like very strong baby zombie bodybuilder plus zombie bad parents Minecraft. 8.6 million views. Or maybe short life brewing boy swimming dating love story all for one, four and one, Minecraft animation. This is far from the only channel that does this, like Monster School Fat to Fit Challenge Minecraft animation, 12 million views. There are so, so many of these Minecraft animations that are just fucking bizarre. I've noticed a lot of the time they have these random meme sound effects just thrown all over the videos in places where it doesn't even make any sense. And obviously there's a trend of shoving random things that are popular with kids in there like Poppy's Playtime and Peppa Pig to up those view counts. I just don't understand it. Treats for Beasts is a channel that has a mix of videos, sometimes live action and sometimes animated, that's been uploading since 2009. It's another channel whose videos are mainly meant to be creepy and unsettling. His most popular video seems to be Who Wants to Gnaw on Human Bones, which was also his first video, where a man in a strange costume frolics through a field while singing Who Wants to Gnaw on Human Bones. I also kind of like the video Beasts. I am the beast that likes to breach. Don't face your problems, resort to belief. I am the beast that chops down trees. They're put here for us so we can do as we please. Another pretty popular one is called I Love Jesus. Yeah, the more videos of his you watch, you can clearly tell there's an underlying theme of anti-religiousness. Treats for Beast is also known as the musician Sanguinarius, as he composes the music in his videos and releases it, similar to Pilot Red Sun. Conspiracy videos are self-explanatory, it's videos about conspiracy theories. There's surprisingly enough a lot of range in how these videos are presented. When I personally think conspiracy theory videos on YouTube, the first one that comes to mind is Wendigoon's Conspiracy Theory Iceberg, and also most iceberg videos talk about a lot of conspiracy theories within them. But honestly, I think a more interesting thing to talk about for this is those weird videos you find with no views about outlandish and esoteric theories. There's a channel I found a bit ago called Mud Fossil University who spouts out a lot of these theories about how the Earth's crust and surface is actually made out of the remains of these ancient colossal creatures who once roamed the planet. Which is fucking awesome by the way, like I'm kinda hoping that's true just because it's cool. Beyond that there's also those classic movie maker conspiracy videos like Harp and Chemtrails and bullshit like that. You know, the ones with either the X-Files theme or Club to Death from the first Matrix movie playing. I've been trying to find videos of what I'm talking about but I think YouTube might have deleted some of them or at least made them harder to find, which I kinda get why they do that but it's still kinda unfortunate it's harder to bask in the nostalgia of these dumb videos. The Wyoming Incident is an ancient ARG that started all the way back in 2006. Not on YouTube, but on Google Video. Yes, Google Video, the thing Google used for video hosting before they even bought out Google later that year. Although, it was later uploaded to YouTube in 2007. The video claims to be an alleged hijacking of a TV station in a similar manner to the Max Headroom incident. Pretty freaky video, you know, you see the message, you will see such pretty things, and there's these floating heads that float around. I don't know. Okay, Local 58 definitely wasn't the first analog horror, I'm convinced now. The video comes with a fun creepypasta attached stating that people who witnessed the hijacking all 
2,000 of them experienced vomiting, hallucinations, headaches, and many other symptoms due to the frequencies played throughout the broadcast. Of course, it's not actually real. If you look the video up on YouTube, you're not gonna, like, die or something, unlike Mariana Mordegard Glesgorv, of course, which will kill you if you watch it. There were a couple more videos after that that were all attached to the ARG that were pretty much the same. The ARG is kind of infamous for being overly convoluted and nonsensical, I mean, even for ARG standards, but I gotta say it was still pretty influential, all things considered. daddy 5 was a YouTube channel ran by Mike Christopher Martin that featured vlogging and quote-unquote prank videos. These pranks weren't really pranks as much as they were Mike and his wife Heather mentally, emotionally, and even physically abusing their children for views on YouTube. The channel is no longer up, but it was active for way longer than it probably should have, like 2015 to 2018. Three whole years. They are, or were, a family of five kids, Jake, Ryan, Emma, Cody, and Alex. Emma and Cody were the children of Mike's ex-girlfriend, Rose Hall, and as such got the brunt of the abuse, especially Cody. There were videos on this channel of Cody getting screamed at, beaten, gaslighted, and otherwise traumatized just because it makes his parents money. There was one video where he threw a Lego at his brother and the parents pranked him into thinking he killed him. There was also, of course, the infamous Invisible Ink prank where his mother covered his carpet in Invisible Ink before screaming at him, blaming the mess on him. In both of these videos, they scream at him at the top of their lungs lungs, then laugh at him maniacally when they finally reveal it was a prank. The intense joy they seemed to exhibit while traumatizing their children felt fucking unreal, and watching and finishing a video of theirs is really hard. The Invisible Ink video released in April of 2017 that got massive negative attention compared to the other videos, making people realize that maybe this shouldn't be on YouTube or anywhere. Many channels such as Philip DeFranco, H3H3 Productions, and Pyrocynical made videos about the channel, and by September of 2017, Mike and Heather were sentenced to five years of supervised probation, and custody over Emma and Cody was returned to their biological mother. Body of a Pig is a classic spooky YouTube video uploaded by a channel named Devin Raymond in 2007. The story of the video goes that these two people were checking out a location that was said to be haunted. They're in this underground cave kind of place, and when they open a door, an EVP, electronic voice phenomenon, can be heard that says, I have the body of a pig, followed by winking noises, I guess. The video then cuts to this photograph that was apparently taken on the excursion, and boom! That's the pig! So... This one I don't understand, right? Why why would he say I have the body of a pig? Is the ghost self-conscious about his body image? Why is it a pig anyways? It seems to be a pretty obvious fake as not only is it just kind of dumb, but also Devin Raymond seems to have many of these paranormal type videos on his channel, and all of them are kind of unconvincing. Still, I'm sure if I saw this when I was like 8, I'd probably ship bricks. WP Kept KW was a rumor of a supposedly cursed video on YouTube, similar to Mr. Glesgorv over here. The rumor was started by this video by user IEEEYer, stating that if you search WP Kept KW, you'll find no results, but sometimes a video will appear. The video has this blurred face while this loud sound plays. After this, they could no longer find the video, and instead this image kept popping up on their screens, similar to various scareware programs, although this was apparently activated by simply viewing a YouTube video. The video is fake since the footage shows that it was uploaded on August 26, 2014, the same day that the IEEE wire video was uploaded. Also, just like, duh. I've heard people saying that the image is actually a blurred out Rick Astley, and while I can't prove this, it's a funny idea, so let's just say it's true. Cat Ghost is an animated web series on YouTube created by Chris Patrick, who is also well known for their other animated series, The Bedfellows. Most of the animations have primarily comedy content, while occasionally dipping into creepy, more surreal content. The main draw is that every single episode has a small game to go along with it, which are more serious in tone compared to the lighthearted videos. The series became a bit of an ARG, and the lore got pretty crazy. I'll link an explained video by Nightmind in the description that goes over everything. The Dawn is Your Enemy refers to a creepy Adult Swim bumper they used to air right before switching back over to Cartoon Network in the mid to late 2000s. The reason they did this, and the reason why the bump is so creepy, is to deter kids from watching any Adult Swim content they weren't supposed to watch. 
The audio is about 9 seconds of hammer clinking and various mechanical noises, and then it ends. There's this one user on YouTube, IKJLeo, that uploaded a quote-unquote full version of the bump, and as it progresses, the audio slowly turns into people screaming in agony. And it's, uh, it's based on a creepypasta. It says so in the description. Scad Shorts is a channel ran by the Dandy Dwarves, which is apparently a group of students at Savannah College Art and Design, hence the name Scad Shorts. This channel produced several short films throughout 2007-2008 until abruptly stopping due to, I assume, all the members graduating. This channel included videos like The Sailor and The Fiendish Foot, where a sailor's foot starts talking to him, Love Hurts, where a fat baby shoots people with a bow and arrow, and Color Me Beautiful, where a woman teaches fitness while getting sprayed with paint for some reason. <laughs> However, the most popular of all the videos on this channel is Pencil Face. Okay, it's not actually the most popular, but it's what the chart says, so whatever. A girl finds this big pencil that can bring to life anything she draws, kind of like the Doodle Bob pencil, except this one has a weird face. She draws a cake, eats some of the cake, then draws a kite, plays with the kite. Then she wants a lollipop, so she draws a big swirly, which instead leads to a portal that she gets sucked into. Then the short ends with a close-up of the pencil's face. Many purport that this video was an allegory for pedophilia or child kidnapping or what have you. Pretty creepy. Back in 2011, a YouTube user by the name of Suicidal Munchkin uploaded a video discussing a disturbing scene in the original Wizard of Oz. You can probably tell where this is going by the channel name, but the scene apparently features a Munchkin actor hanging himself on set. According to the user, the Munchkin is only visible in old VHS copies of the film, accidentally left in by the producers, and was promptly replaced with just a big bird when the movie came to DVD. The thing is, this never happened. It was just a hoax. It was just another person telling lies on the internet, although this hoax often often persists to this day, as you can still find movie facts channels and stuff talking about it. Quite impressive longevity, but no, no one fucking hung themselves on the set of Wizard of Oz. All that happened was the actor for Tin Man's makeup put him in an iron lung, the Wicked Witch had her face get second degree burns, the Cowardly Lion's fur was made of real lion fur, and Dorothy was verbally abused and forced to take drugs with fucked her up for life. But come on, a munchkin didn't hang himself, don't be stupid. Yelling Creature is a six second long video by a user named Rob Herman of a creature yelling. It got millions of views because it looks weird. I don't really know what else to say here. There's a Halloween version and a Christmas version. Yeah, I don't know what you want from me. Chip Chan is a South Korean woman of an unknown age who has been livestreaming her daily life for the past 12 years or so. She believes that she has an implant in her brain that the government is using to control her thoughts, earning her the nickname Chip Chan. She also believes that she's being held hostage in her own apartment by a police officer she refers to as just P. She apparently has barely left her apartment in the past 25 years and spends her days surfing the internet and sleeping. Obviously, she's in very poor health as a result of this, being very unkempt and lethargic, and often has outbreaks of skin conditions like rashes and wounds. She was found by 4chan in 2008 on a thread where people discussing various unsecured webcams and noticed she had tons of different cameras and signs in her house that she set up herself. In 2018, she went missing, as in her livestream shut off for the first time in a decade. However, she came back in 2021 to her YouTube channel. She doesn't livestream anymore, but instead uploads videos documenting her various skin rashes, which are pretty gross videos, so I'm not going to be showing them. But she claims that the rashes are caused by the chip implanted into her. She also sometimes goes outside and records various interactions with police officers, and I use the term interactions loosely since they're mostly just driving past her or her stalking them. The whole situation seems to be a combination of a severe case of paranoid schizophrenia and South Korea's notoriously terrible mental health programs. Sad Satan is a video game that was first discovered by a YouTube user named Obscure Horror Corner in 2015. The user claims that he found the game on the deep web while using the Tor browser and that it came from a mysterious source only known as ZK. The Let's Play was five videos long before ending two weeks after it started. Many of Obscure Horror Corner's fans showed concern from the game, since the deep web can often feature disturbing content such as gore or child pornography. But OHC claims that it features no such content. However, there are a lot of images that pop up of famous child predators, such as Tsutomu Miyazaki, Jimmy Seville, and Rolf Harris. He then provides a dot .onion link for the game, although people quickly realize that it's an invalid link, which he defends stating that it got taken down at some point. Only problem is that Onion Links use Base32 encoding, and his link had a 9 in it, which isn't a valid character in Base32, so the whole link was never valid. Weird. 
OHC became more and more unreliable as digging into his Reddit account revealed an interest in developing his own horror game. Gee, I, I wonder if he ever uh, pulled that off. He also defended the invalid links, saying that he gave everyone a fake URL because he didn't feel comfortable distributing a link to a webpage that featured child porn. Uh, didn't he just say that the game didn't feature exactly that? After this, an anonymous user on 4chan came on to post a link to download Sad Satan, signing his post to ZK. People downloaded it and began to realize that the title screen is literally a child's naked corpse, and many other CP images show up throughout the game, which were not present on Obscure Horror Corner's original playthrough. People also began to suffer computer crashes, odd computer behavior, and even failure to boot at all after playing the game. What once was thought to be a fun little ARG slash creepypasta mystery quickly turned into actual criminal activity. While Obscure Horror Corner is most likely the creator of the version used in the videos, it's still unclear to this day whether the 4chan post was made by him or a troll wanting to frame him for something he didn't do, as there's a lot of evidence for both sides. I'll link a video from Gamer from Mars in the description that goes more in depth about the situation. Tyler's last words was a video uploaded by a channel named Delarge Tyler in 2011, which features a depressed looking man, who we can assume to be named Tyler, singing a song addressed to a woman named Victoria, who again we can assume to be deceased. At the end of the video he points a gun at his head and then the video ends. The video description reads, this is my brother's last song to his wife, as he requested in his note. I'm sorry if this offends anyone. I love my brother and I owe this to him. Pretty damn sad, but isn't it kind of weird how his brother didn't cut out the part with the gun? That's because it's fake. It was discovered that the man in the video was Austin Cross, a band member of a music group called My Fair Fiend, as a publicity stunt to promote an album called, well, Victoria. To be honest, I don't really know why he did this, since we didn't even know who he was until nine years later. It doesn't really seem like effective advertising to me. Although he did get three scare theater videos, so maybe it wasn't that bad of an idea. Limbo the Organized Mind was a short film produced by Jim Henson, who is most well known for his work on The Muppets. First performed in 1966 on the Mike Douglas show, the short features a character named Limbo, also known as Nobody, who's a white set of eyes and a mouth. The short is oddly psychological and experimental, as the character takes us through the human mind and its inner workings. He takes us through his thoughts, both the average ones and the evil ones, before his brain explodes. There's also a character who shows up during the short called The Nightmare, and... yeah. Interestingly enough, this nobody character is actually an official Muppet and even showed up on Sesame Street once. I don't think Disney has any interest in using him again though, call it a hunch. Carl Mayer is a video uploaded by Ms. Carl Me in 2008. It's a Windows Movie Maker slideshow featuring random images like these twins, some flowers, Pennywise, a clown, and what looks like the ocean among other things. What makes this video so notable is the audio used. It sounds like someone screaming, singing, and making other strange vocalizations. The audio gets louder and louder to the point where it's nearly unbearable near the end. So, what's the deal? Well, the description reads Carl Mayer EP with some Japanese text at the bottom. Carl Mayer EP extended play. You see, Carl Mayer was actually the name of a noise music band from Yokohama, Japan, active from 1991 to 1994, and yeah, this is pretty much what their music sounded like. That's pretty much all there is to this, just a strange video that uses some obscure noise music. The Slamming Door is a channel ran by a Polish man who claims that his house is haunted by a ghost, or demon, or some other kind of otherworldly invisible troublemaker. The channel has had several uploads that were posted over the course of two years, 2015 and 2016. Throughout the videos, the ghost pushes shit over, makes random noises, and yes, even slams doors. The man who ran the channel also ran a blog written entirely in Polish. There's not really much cold hard evidence that this channel is fake, nor is there really any that it says it's real. Ghost videos are pretty easy to replicate though, as all you really need is some invisible string and some friends to pull it. Also, he faints by falling to his knees, which is not how fainting works. Hi, I'm Mary Mary is a horror web series and ARG that started back in 2016 and lasted all the way to 2020, consisting of a Twitter account, a blogspot, and, you guessed it, a YouTube channel. The basic plot is that a woman wakes up in a house that resembles her parents' home and quickly realizes that she's trapped and alone. The doors are all locked and she can never see any people through the windows. 
The food is seemingly infinitely restocked, and she even has internet access, although she quickly discovers that the entire internet is devoid of activity, save for herself. So, in lore, she's uploading these videos to YouTube, fully under the impression that zero people are watching any of them. Hi, I'm Mary Mary is one of the most well-made horror series on the website, and I'd recommend checking it out if you haven't. 00390 is a channel created in 2015 by an unknown user from Milan, Italy. The description reads both in English and Italian, Do not subscribe, you bother me, and do not offer me money for affiliation or visualizations or other, I am not interested. At best, offer me some typical food of your country. Then at the bottom it says an Italian sentence that roughly translates to, I like cold but alive girls. Weird. Delving into the channel's actual content, it gets weirder. They have several videos where they drive through red light districts and videotape sex workers, seemingly without consent, while ominous music plays. Another video called Girl Talk Too Much, which features what seems to be a severed tongue. I mean, it's a cow tongue and not an actual human tongue, but it's still pretty freaky. There's one video called How to Transport a Semi-Unconscious Girl, which, yeah, that one speaks for itself. Another called Dressed Girl in the Bath Scared Screams, which is a video of a girl screaming in a bathtub. So, is this really a serial kidnapper, murderer, and cannibal that focuses on Italian women? I heavily doubt it, since there's a lot of evidence point to it not being real, like there not being any missing persons in Milan that match up with the video, and also the whole thing just kind of seems try-hard edgy more than anything. It's probably an art project or some kind of ARG or maybe even a fetish kind of thing. But I don't personally think it's real, especially since the channel has been uploading pretty consistently for the past seven years and has never gotten caught or even kicked off YouTube. But hey, I might be wrong, I don't know. Nagumu is a Japanese channel started in 2016. He's one of the first VTubers, and no, I'm not saying that as a dude in Knowing Orange is technically a VTuber, like, no. He specifically refers to himself as a VTuber that predates even the likes of Kazuna Ai. Now, the first thing you may realize about this YouTuber is that He's fucking creepy. The channel gained popularity thanks to many popular Japanese YouTubers shouting him out. Now, I know what you're thinking. Fourth fucking shitty ARG in a row. I'm starting to get sick of these. And yeah, that's fair, but this channel seems like a parody of VTubers taking a horror approach to the way it parodies them. And man, does it delve far into the uncanny valley side of things with creepy imagery and strange messages saying that he's right behind you and he wants to suck your lifeblood and all that kind of stuff. Nagumu isn't actually a murderer though, it's just all an act for the art. Deeper is another ARG channel that was active from 2016 to 2019. The videos were often short and featured mildly disturbing imagery and hidden codes. They were already kind of weird on their own, but where this channel really gained infamy was the codes, which usually led to information related to unsolved murder cases and missing person reports. Nothing that wasn't already out in the open about these cases, of course. It's basically just the names of the victims, but it's still pretty creepy. This led many people to believe that whoever ran the channel was the real person behind the murder cases, which is plausible, I guess, but also, I don't know. These videos are oddly enough monetized, as you can see ads running on them, and I'm not really sure how likely it is that a serial killer would do that. Mudahar of Some Ordinary Gamers released a video on this channel on June 15th, 2019, and a day later the ARG ended with a video being released that had a code in the title. Decoding it led to a URL to this image, which basically stated that the person who ran the channel had passed away. Whether this is true and the person who ran this channel actually died, or they just wanted to end the ARG, is still unclear to this day. Lion Maker Studios was a YouTuber who primarily created Minecraft videos aimed at a young audience. At the peak of his popularity, he had 800,000 subscribers, helped in no small part by other fellow content creators he did collaborations with, such as Stampy Longhead. Or, I guess I should correct myself, 800,000 cubs as he infamously dubbed them. You see, Lion Maker was a deeply, deeply flawed man who used his position of power for his own gratification. He would often invite his fans, most of which were around the 12 to 16 years old age range, to Skype groups where he would use them as his therapists and even begin to flirt with them in a sexual manner. One concerned parent of a 13 year old fan went on Keemstar's drama alert to allege that Lion Maker had been sexting her daughter and even asking her for nudes. Another fan, a 16 year old boy, uploaded a video about how Lion Maker had sent him 500 US dollars to take nude photos of himself. Lion Maker then got into a public relationship with a YouTuber named Paige the Panda, who was a 16 year old girl. 
People caught on pretty quickly that flirting with someone who was an entire decade younger than him was really fucking weird. He of course responded rationally by having a few meltdowns on Twitter and then tweeting out sexually explicit images of Paige. And I'm not talking about suggestive photos, this was straight up CP that he was publicly posting on Twitter.com. He defended both of these by saying everything was the result of a hack by Keemstar. Everything. Now, that's not to say Keemstar isn't a cock. He still is. Nor is he a stranger to hacking people for no reason. But that just doesn't add up if you think about it for more than, like, three seconds. A YouTuber named Colossal is Crazy made a video bringing these issues to light, and Lionmaker went dark for the rest of the year until he agreed to a two-hour-long interview with Colossal, which TLDR left more questions than answers. In 2018, two years later, Lionmaker's channels finally went down at YouTube staff's hands. Later that year, Paige uploaded the video to her private channel discussing her experiences with Lionmaker, stating that he would manipulate her by screaming at her and telling her that everything was her fault. They also apparently met up in real life several times, so their relationship was somehow even worse than we thought. He went to court on account of possession and distribution of child porn, sexual assault, and sexual relations with a minor, and pled guilty to all of them. He didn't go to jail, but was placed on house arrest, with one of the terms being that he was not permitted to start a new YouTube channel. Which he did anyways, before getting taken down again. Nowadays, it's not really clear what he's up to, but he will remain in history as not only one of YouTube's most infamous predators, but also one of the dumbest ones too. Kate Yup is a YouTuber who joined YouTube in 2018, who almost exclusively uploads mukbang videos, more specifically seafood mukbangs. All of her videos have her blindfolded for some reason, and she never speaks in the videos, and all you can hear is the sound of her chewing and lip smacking. Some of her videos are labeled as ASMR, which I don't personally understand, I hate the sound of eating, but whatever, that's not the main point here. People began to discover that in some of Kate's videos, she was clearly injured. A bruise on her hand, a cut on her lip, and even a tooth falling out. There's even a voice heard in one of the videos that says to hurry up and just eat. Viewers quickly began theorizing that Kate had been kidnapped and that her captor is forcing her to make and upload mukbang videos to YouTube. She'd often dispel these theories in a way that many saw as forced while also providing hints that they were true, like for example her apparently tapping a bowl to SOS in Morse code. She also adds in text sometimes, and this text showed up in one of her videos with the first four letters reading HELP, and another that read this meat is so delicious and tender with the letters SOS capitalized. So was she really kidnapped? Well, like with a lot of these, nothing's really set in stone. Theories trying to connect her to various missing person reports have been shot all over the place, although pretty much all of them have had things going against them. My personal theory is that she saw people getting alarmed at her videos, and to stir up more interest in her channel, she created a narrative that she was kidnapped, which kind of worked. She's currently sitting at over 1.5 million subscribers and 152 million views, so the act kind of worked out for her. She abruptly stopped uploading in 2019, before coming back three years later near the tail end end of 2022, and she's uploaded three videos since then, along with an added link in her bio that's called The Kitty to Help Kate Yup. The link itself appears to be a dead leechy link, which is a French crowdfunding site. Huh. I'll let you guys figure that one out for yourself. Brian is a YouTube channel run by a man who's presumably named Brian. He uploads these 3D animations that look really weird, definitely tapping into the Uncanny Valley side of things. They look like they were most likely made in Gary's Mod, or Source Filmmaker, or something of the sort. Sorry, I'm no expert. Look, if you pointed a gun to my head and asked me to tell you what was the plot of literally any of these videos, I'm on YouTube so I can't finish this sentence. I don't really even think they have a plot, I think they're just meant to unsettle you. Looking in the description of any of Brian's videos, we can see links to various different music streaming platforms. Spotify, Apple Music, Pandora, you know. Apparently all the music used in these videos is from Brian's self-titled album, which makes everything make a lot more sense. These videos are weird because they're music videos, and that's also why the music is so good. Kinda reminds me of Pilot Red Sun. The Grifter is an apparently cursed videotape that was first mentioned on 4chan's X board in 2009. From the creepypasta wiki, we can see that watching it is said to be a soul-rending experience, far more horrible than anything anyone could imagine. The actual video itself, or rather what's said to be a small snippet of it, appears to have someone walking down a hallway with cuts to a bathtub full of maggots, a crying infant, and then finally text an Esperanto of all languages that translates to, This child, now a young man, is living in an asylum 
in a local whose name was not given. He has never spoken and remains catatonic. The full film would presumably be a hardcore snuff film, including stuff like animal abuse, dead babies, severed body parts, you know, all that fun stuff. It even, interestingly enough, has an IMDb page that states the full film is a full 24 hours long. Weird. With all that said, The Grifter isn't real. It's not a real movie that exists. Some of the clips have been traced back to the 2000 horror film Little Odic, and there isn't even really a source for anything related to The Grifter that can't be chalked up to people trolling on 4chan. Illusion of Bias is a short film by Influential Pictures, directed and produced by Alexander Bizarsky and Sparks Rojas, first released in 2009 and later uploaded to YouTube by a channel named Mind Sea Base in the same year. It follows the story of a 10 year old girl who developed a brain tumor. She got surgery to get it removed and as a result lost the ability to see her own face. She becomes depressed for years and at one point she has a dream where she can finally see what her face looks like after all that time and it's horrible and disfigured, causing her to vomit. But it was only a dream that she eventually wakes up for, and she still never knows what her face looks like, and as the narrator says, every night since then she wakes up in a puddle of her own vomit. He then tells you, the viewer, to appreciate the things you have, because something like this could happen to you. That's pretty much where it ends, no creepypasta or ARG attached to this one, just a short horror film with interesting visuals and kind of a ham-fisted moral lesson at the end. Fatal Farm is a YouTube channel and video production studio headed by comedy duo Zachary Johnson and Jeffrey Max. They began making YouTube content all the way back in 2006 and have since made many popular projects. Starting off with their least popular channel being the main one, their main content is alternate TV intros where they parody several TV shows like Golden Girls and DuckTales and put a fucked up little spin on it in classic late 2000s YouTube fashion. Another channel they ran was called Infinite Solutions where a character named Mark Erickson teaches you very various life hacks that may or may not be complete lies, like recharging batteries by making them kiss, wrapping an ethernet cord around your phone to make your computer's Wi-Fi connection, or most infamously, how to get into a service called Google TV where you can stream TV shows directly onto your PC. Like that'll ever happen. Infinite Solutions was a very influential trolling channel because basically everyone believed in it, since it was pretty much the most professional looking tutorials on YouTube at the time, especially when compared to the unregistered hypercam notepad narration tutorials that dominated that era. The Google TV hoax was so convincing that tech sites actually began reporting on it because of the video, and Google had to issue a statement saying that it was a hoax before starting a now discontinued service three years later, literally called Google TV. But above both Infinite Solutions and the alternate TV intros, one project they produced stands out above the rest. I'm of course talking about Lasagna Cat, a web series started in 2008 that serves as a parody of Garfield, and it's possibly one of the most facetious and passive-aggressive pieces of media I've ever seen. The format usually follows a live-action reenactment of a Garfield comic strip from a given day, indicated by the title of the video, followed by an absurd little skit, I guess, that are supposed to be tributes to Jim Davis, the creator of Garfield. These tributes can really be anything, and are generally not exactly a genuine appreciation for Jim and his work. Take the first one, for example, which is modeled after a Final Fantasy VI boss fight, and when Garfield wins the fight against John and Odie, Jim Davis joins his party. He tries to look at Jim's skills, only to find out he has no skills. The series often parodies how repetitive and unfunny the jokes are in the comic, with frequent laugh tracks and Garfield constantly spouting catchphrases. The series stopped the same year it started, but came back nine years later in 2017, asking viewers to call into a phone number and state their name and number of sexual partners. Then a month later, a second season of Lasagna Cat was produced, including a parody of Colin's Bear animation, a gay porn parody, and a special episode for the very first comic strip. This episode features film actor John Blythe Barrymore as he spends an entire hour musing about the philosophy of how Jim Davis is the most genius artist of our generation. Facetiously, of course. And finally, we arrive at the final Lasagna Cat episode, a four and a half hour long video of the sex survey results, framed as a series of knock-knock jokes with John, Garfield, and Odie rotating through answering and also some art film-ass shit that happens at the end that I don't even really feel like spoiling, just watch for yourself. The dedication to this channel is actually unreal because literally the only point of all of this is to tell Jim Davis he isn't funny. I honestly can't even imagine being that much of a hater. 
The Bitterroot footage is a creepypasta story about a man who goes looking for furniture on Craigslist and finds a table that comes with a couple of random assorted items for free, most of which he gives away, but one item catches his interest. A wooden box that was locked, which he promptly opened with a screwdriver, only to find a couple images, and a tin can that contained a reel of 8mm film. The reel had about 12 minutes of footage, but our protagonist could only salvage five. The film itself has a cameraman following a cloaked figure into some sort of abandoned building, witnesses a kidnapping, finds an incubator for dead bodies, and finds a severed head in a forest nearby. And that's pretty much the whole thing. The story was decently popular and even had a cute little website, but yeah, you guessed it, it's fake. The author came forward about four years ago and said that it's fake and shed light on how he made it. Well, actually, there's no way of verifying this Reddit post is really him, but like, come on guys, you should know that it's fake. If there were real dead bodies, it would be taken off YouTube and the Karen is supposed to be hiding from the cloaked figure, but he's very clearly off lot hiding. This is another rabbit hole, kind of like Christian, where there's so much to it, I can't really describe in a single entry of a thousand plus entry iceberg, but I'll do my best. Terry Davis was an American programmer and hardcore Christian who designed a 64-bit operating system named Temple OS all by himself, which if you don't know, is a ridiculously ambitious thing to do, since usually operating systems have huge teams of people working on them instead of just one dude from Wisconsin. He got the idea in 1996 after a series of manic episodes which he called Revelations from God, and began development in 2003 with the first public release in 2005, first named J Operating System, then Luzthos, and finally Temple OS. It was specifically designed with biblical themes in mind, as Terry would say that God told him to make the OS as the third temple of Jerusalem that's prophesied in the Bible. Much like the authors of the Bible are thought to have been God's chosen writers, endowed with divine intellect and unlimited writing talent, Terry claimed he was God's chosen programmer. And to be fair, I can't stress enough how talented he was. Not only did he make the entire operating system, programs, window manager, etc, etc, he also made the programming language used to construct it, an edit of C titled Holy C. Do you get it? If you can't tell by now, Terry was not the most mentally stable person, diagnosed with bipolar disorder and later schizophrenia. He was an avid conspiracy theorist, often having delusions of space aliens and government agents that he famously said, glow in the dark. The CIA glow in the dark. You can see them if you're driving. You just run them over. That's what you do. Temple OS was 640 by 480, could not display more than 16 colors at a time, and had zero networking capabilities, so when you used it, all you could really do was play the games on it, which weren't exactly functional, but still impressive to a degree. Temple OS has gotten sympathetic reviews from most tech sites, stating that while it didn't work amazingly, the dedication to the craft was unmatched. Davis himself, however, was Quite a controversial figure, as along with the CIA conspiracy theories, he would often frequently use slurs like the N-word, which he claimed was a form of combating psychological warfare. Due to his uniqueness, he would often be targeted by online trolls, which only let his mental health get worse and worse. His YouTube channels, where he posted updates about Temple OS and other projects and life stuff, were often terminated because of his frequent slurring and general violent language. By 2017, he would often spend a large expanse of time homeless or incarcerated, and in 2018, he passed away from being hit by a train in the Dallas, Oregon, which was believed to be a suicide. If you want to learn more about the Terry Davis and Temple OS story, I would recommend checking out the Down the Rabbit Hole episode on them by Frederick Knudsen. It's one of the greatest documentary video essays this site has to offer. And that's the end of part one of tier four of the YouTube iceberg. I don't know about you guys, but I'm really enjoying this tier. The first three tiers weren't boring, but they weren't exactly the most exciting thing ever, as a lot of entries I already knew. Back in those tiers, I kinda had to add some fun facts in to make it feel more interesting and fresh. But now these entries are more inherently interesting to talk about, as they're often a bit darker topics. This is why this tier is split up just as much as tier 3, despite there being significantly less entries, as there's gonna be a lot more stuff I can talk about for each one. I feel like in general, this series has taken a bit of a tone shift as of this video, since we're now delving into the more mysterious and deep side of YouTube. I hope you're as excited as I am. I don't have much else to say, so I'll just end this off by saying, I'll see you all in the next part of the massive YouTube iceberg. Take care.